Okay, so what are we doing tonight? This is a Friday Night Salon, which is really all about writing in community and hearing about our guest authors and their experience. So we're going to do a lot of really nice things tonight. First of all, we're going to discuss how to write first love in all of its complexities. We're also going to explore queer identity, disability, and the intersection of the two. And then after Melissa has a chance to tell about their professional journey and their experience writing their book, Love Letters for Joy, we are going to dive into some writing prompts. So we're gonna to get to experience some writing ourselves tonight as well. Okay, so first thing we're going to do before I introduce Melissa is we're going to do an opening lines activity. If you have been at events with us before, you know uh, these are a part of every event that we do. If you have not, opening lines are a really great activity to kind of bring you from wherever you were before this event into this space being here with girls right now and creating together. So for today's opening lines, we are going to write some love letters. So I hope you are excited to think about love and joy in your own life. We're going to write a letter to someone or something that you love. You can really think outside the box here. You can write to anyone, yourself included. I hope you all love yourselves or anything that brings you joy. So I really think anyone or anything that you are feeling really happy, really cozy about today. We're gonna to take five minutes and we are going to write some love letters. We'll play some music and then come back and share those out if you feel comfortable doing so. So we'll put five minutes on the clock. Enjoy writing your love letters. Uh, without further ado, I am so excited that now I get to introduce our incredible guest author, for the night. Uh, so Melissa C. is a disabled queer author of young adult contemporary romances. She lives in New York City where she works in children's publishing. When not writing, she can be found reading, playing Dungeons and Dragons, or curled up with her cat, most likely watching Dimension 20. I am so excited to have Melissa here to talk about her professional journey, the experience of writing Love Letters for Joy, her new book, and to read some excerpts and introduce some writing prompts for us. So with that, I'll let you take it away, Melissa. Well, hi everyone. Thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Melissa C. I'm a queer, disabled, YA contemporary romance author. My first book, You Mean Our Heartstrings, is out now, and it features two disabled orchestra musicians who have to go up against disability sensationalism after their duet goes unexpectedly viral. It doesn't so much, you know, knock kindly on the door of ableism and disability sensationalism in media, so much as it just rips off the hinges. So if that sounds good to you, it's out now. You can read it now. Here you go. And now, well, not now, in three months, <laughs> Love Letters for Joy releases, which is a queer, disabled, YA contemporary romance slash serial retelling about, you know, just nerds falling in love, graduation, senior year, all of those complicated feelings. And it unintentionally is a retelling of serial. <laughs> I did not intend for that. I'll speak about that later. But as for my professional journey, I, when did I, I queried Yumi and our heartstrings I want to say like 2020 or something. I, I honestly don't remember. It's It's been a little bit of a blur. And I was in the query trenches, which is the process of getting an agent for like, I think 66 days. I got my agent. We sold you made our heartstrings pretty soon after I signed with her. And that book came out, which was just a huge moment for me because I know I've wanted to be a writer since I was seven years old. I distinctly remember the moment, which is very, very strange whenever I tell people this, but I was seven years old. My sister was on a traveling softball team and I would have just big black contractor bags full of books. When I was young, I was very tiny because that's what premature babies end up being. We end up being very tiny children. So I had three huge black contractor bags full of books that I would just drag around. I don't know how I was able to drag them around at all like that's just not possible but anyway I did it and so I was reading on the bleachers one night at sunset and I realized at seven years old hang on people write books people get paid to write books that's what I want to do <laughs> so it just kind of stuck and I guess I was just determined enough to get there and then as far as the reception of being a disabled author and not having that representation growing up because growing up I didn't have really any representation I remember one book 
with disability representation when I was a teenager. And when I read it, I was just like, oh, okay, wait, wait, hang on. Like cerebral palsy, like, like that's like that's written in this book. Like what? <laughs> so like I like I didn't like and for a long time I didn't write about disabled characters because it didn't it didn't occur to me to write about them at all. And then as more YA with disabled characters started coming out and I saw just everything changing, I was like, okay, like, let me see if I can do this. And then I wrote Yumi and Our Heartstrings and I was scared because I, disability sensationalism is rife within media. And I was scared that people weren't going to be ready to have to look at the media that we consume and how it portrays disabled people in not necessarily the best way. But I guess people liked it because it's out now. <laughs> so there's that. And then as far as Love Letters for Joy, I wrote this um, on what's called On Proposal, um, which means that I submitted three chapters and an outline. Um, and that, that, was, that was an experience um, because I'd never done that before. <laughs> and so what happened was my critique partner, Tia, who I love very much and who this book is dedicated to, by the way, um, we were in Tennessee. And we went up to Tennessee for, I think, five or six days. And she had whiteboards with her. And she's like, okay, we're going to take this idea. We're going to take this idea and we're going to make it into a proposal. In the six days we are here, we are going to do this. We're going to plot up this whole entire book. Let's go. And so multiple whiteboards. They had titles individually. It was beautiful. It was magical. It was perfect. And then on the ride to the airport, I was already emotional because I didn't want to leave Tia. I love Tia. I don't want to be separated from her. And she looks at me as we were on the highway in the middle of uh, Nashville. You know, our belly's probably full of donut country and, and Maple Street Biscuit Company and just other glorious, glorious, glorious restaurants. And she looks at me and she says, hear me out. And I said, okay. And she said, I want Redacted to be our hero. And I'm like, oh my God, it makes so much sense. Oh my God, oh my God. And so I ended up texting my agent and calling her in the middle of the highway being like, okay, look, I know, I know, I know this is not how we planned it, but this is, what, but this is what's happening. Like, can I do this? Is this okay? And I had to tell her it twice because I was speaking too fast the first time. And she was like, I like it. I'm like, cool. And then like that, I just, I, me and Tia reworked the plot of that book in five, in the most five adrenaline fueled minutes of my life. That was incredible. And that is why this book is dedicated to her. And Joy, she, she, she is, she honestly, I was not expecting her to be such an introspective look at disability and queerness and queer identity and how those two things kind of intersect because I talk a lot about how disability and queerness are not mutually exclusive experiences whatsoever. You can be both disabled and queer and that's perfectly okay and you can learn about yourself as you go within your life because when I wrote Love Letters for Joy I didn't realize I was gender non-conforming but I am and I love that part of myself and then when I, when I wrote Joy, I knew I was asexual. And I knew, I'm like, I want to write about a disabled asexual teenager falling in love. And her love interest, whose name I will not spoil, this is going to be an exercise in not spoiling who he is. <laughs> he is also disabled and queer. So having two disabled queer teenagers fall in love with each other and have it not be about how they're inspirational or, or anything like that. They're disabled and they're queer and they fall in love. And it's, I hope, this beautiful experience of finding people who love you and cherish you for exactly the person you are. And if you're disabled and queer, it's just this, it's, it's walking amongst two different worlds. Three actually, because you're walking in because you're walking in the world that was not made with disabled people in mind. And then you're walking into the world of what it's like to be a disabled person. And then when you realize you are not straight, 
you're walking in that world as well. And then you have to figure out, okay, how am I supposed to walk in three worlds at once? And I'm here to tell you that it's possible and you are going to be okay. And that is what I believe Joy and Cupid, for all intents and purposes, that is, that is who he is. Uh, Cupid are going to, like, I think that that's what they learn. And I hope that when you guys read Love Letters for Joy, when it releases on June 6th, during Pride Month, so happy early Pride Month to everyone, um, I hope that you kind of take that solace where if you're disabled and queer, you are worthy of a love story. And hopefully Joy and Cupid can give you some of that solace. I marked these. Yes, I did. <laughs> All right. Okay. Oh, wait, hang on. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Joy! Nathaniel's voice rings out through the hallway, practically making the spray of freckles across my nose go pink from embarrassment. Good morning! Luca and Valentina smirk at me before stepping aside. My friends like to joke that Nathaniel and I are secretly in love and that our competition for valedictorian is what's fueling the passion. They couldn't be more incorrect, but I humor them anyway. It's easier if I just play along so that it's over faster and we can all get to class. Morning, Nathaniel. I reply as good naturedly as I could muster. Nathaniel strides over to me with long legs. Gorgeous enough to be a model, he has sky blue eyes, a head of gold curls, and a jawline like a cut glass. He could also have anyone else he wants, an overly enthusiastic cheerleader or the captain of the football team, perhaps, but he's never actually dated anyone that I know of. Are you ready for our final meeting before break? He asks loftily. Mr. Bowman wants us to lead a discussion on cells, remember? Uh, of course I do. I looked down at my gray pleated skirt, plum colored blazer, white dress shirt, and the time on the fixes for me every morning. I'm the one who suggested the top I'm the one who suggested the topic. Nathaniel's grin falters the slightest bit. Only because you got a better grade than me on that paper about cellular structure. He's well over six feet tall, so as he bounces on the balls of his feet, his body tilts, shadowing my decidedly shorter frame. You wanted to rub it in. It's okay, I mutter my lips switching. You can admit that you were jealous of how I got a better grade than you. Joy, the thinner slowly stops moving his feet, placing his hand over his tie. Are you suggesting that it's my fault that autosave malfunctioned and deleted my notes on cellular structure in the first place? No. My left hand twists into a knot, and I raise it up near my chest. What I am suggesting, however, is that my understanding of cellular structure far surpasses yours, and you just won't admit it. Nathaniel's mouth drops open, and he staggers backward. I didn't come here to be insulted, he mutters. No, just to insult me, because you can stomach the thought that I'm better at something than you are, I retort. I only came here to tell you that I'm going to be late to club today, Nathaniel continues as, I, as if I hadn't said anything. But only by a few minutes. I have a meeting with Miss Gupta to go over my, my academic progress. He raises one eyebrow. Are you meeting with your guidance counselor, too? I'm meeting with Mr. Moses the first week back. Each vertebra of my spine clicks into place as I straighten my back. But my academic progress is excellent. Mine too, Nathaniel replies smoothly. I'm only meeting with her too. What difference does now versus January make? Valentina asks, eager to have something besides her love letter to grasp onto. It's the last day before break. Come on, be realistic. Nathaniel and I gasp, placing our hands over our hearts. Every day of school matters, we say in unison as the bell rings. Come on, I mumble, my cheeks warm. Let's get to class. When the four of us head upstairs to the science wing, Luca and Valentina look at me, their eyes gleaming in anticipation. Anticipation of what, though? It's not like I'm going to run past Nathaniel and confess my feelings for him on the step above him, like some rude academic homage to the balcony scene in Romeo and Juliet. Last year, Nathaniel and I have been last year Nathaniel and I had been chosen to read that scene in AP English and ended up arguing about line interpretation instead. I mean, what does a pompous flirt genuinely know about romance anyway? And that's it. <laughs> I love it. Oh my God. I'm so excited to read this book like, when it comes out. All right. So then we can move into our first writing prompt. Melissa, do you want to talk a bit about this prompt? Yeah, sure. So um, as you can see, uh, there is, you know, valedictorian versus valedictorian hopeful in Love Letters for Joy. So I want y'all to write about two characters who hate each other and have and have a lot of fun. Just have as much fun as you want. I know, I won't be long. What's Nathaniel doing here? Last minute shopping? Typical of someone so self-centered. I'm rooted to the carpet because of a muscle spasm that has chosen this exact moment to snake down my left side, but also because I have no idea what I'll say to Nathaniel if he sees me. I'm aware that it's the holiday season. I will be sure to pick out just the right thing, Nathaniel continues. I'll be back soon. I know he's about to run it. I know he's about to turn and see me, but I still can bring myself to move a muscle. Joy! Nathaniel yelps my name when he runs the, when he runs the shelves and our eyes meet. Hi, Nathaniel. 
I grabbed the first volume of the Poison King just so I have something to do with my hands. His eyes flicked under the cover, then back up to me, his pupils widening for a second. I doubt he's ever seen me with a book other than a textbook or a sign reading from English. It's Christmas Eve. What are you doing here? I could ask you the same question. The thinner shoulders are stiff beneath his, beneath his khaki pea coat, pushing out the simple brown scarf tied around his throat. He fixes his smirk back. He, sm he fixes his smirk back in place. What are you doing here? I step forward, the volume of manga bending against my chest. I asked you first. That's true, Nathaniel says thoughtfully. The tip of his tongue pokes out from the side of his mouth, sweeping across his bottom lip. Well, I'm here to buy a present. He holds out an enormous black leather bound book with gilded silver edges. Gray's anatomy is printed across the front with a silver stamp of lungs just below it. For myself, he adds. A text on human anatomy from the 19th century. I trace the design of the lungs with my eyes and look up at him. I have the same book in my bedroom, which throws me. Well, it's our senior year, he says. I'm looking into all my options. I can do anything, go anywhere. Dr. Wright, doesn't that have a nice ring? Nathaniel's confidence pricks up my skin. He isn't afraid of following any dream, even if that takes him away from the friends he knows. Nathaniel blinks at me, completely silent, so that I could experience an existential crisis in peace. Or maybe just so that I could explain what I'm doing in the bookstore on Christmas Eve. That's really nice. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth with each word. Do you, um, know what specialty you might want to go into? Not yet. Nathaniel's eyes drift down toward, um, to his shiny brown loafers. But I have four years to pre my biology before I need to decide. He, gazes, he glances up at me, a flicker of light in his gaze. Do you know what you're going to study after you graduate? Oh, I nod, my left hand curling out on itself. Yes, I I'm, I'm going into nursing, to be a NICU nurse, like my mom. Nathaniel goes quiet, too quiet. He's probably, think he's probably taking his time to silently judge me. I bet he's thinking, a nurse, not a doctor. Well, he says finally, I think that's perfect. I stare at him. What makes you say that? Because, Joy, Nathaniel smiles, just a glimpse of white teeth through pink lips. Then even after graduation, we'll be on similar paths, which means our competition can continue. You can't throw me off, I tell him. That valedictorian spot is mine. We'll see about that, Nathaniel says, extending his hand to me. I hope you're practicing your lines for when you lose. I take his hand in mine, marveling for the briefest moment at how warm it is despite the freezing temperature outside. I didn't even bother committing them to memory. We shake once and drop our hands. Anyway, Nathaniel placed his throat. Um, are you buying a present for yourself as well? No. I hold out the volume of the Poison King, watching as his eyes roll over the cover, taking in every detail of the gorgeous artwork the same way I took in the lungs on the cover of Grey's Anatomy. It's for Luca. Nathaniel's eyes snap to me. Snap to mine. Luca? He repeats the name as if it's a person he doesn't know. Yeah. I tuck the book, I tuck the book against my chest. My ace pride scarf itches my neck, and I tug at it with my left hand. Our families celebrate together, and we exchange gifts. Oh. When I look up at it, when I look up at him, his eyes aren't on mine. They're studying my spastic left fingers tangled in the arm of my scarf, as though he doesn't see me spasm every day. Well, that's nice. Nathaniel says, glancing down at his phone, which is start, which has just started to vibrate. I need to get going. I might throw this thing into the Hudson if I get one more text. He chuckles. Hang on. Hey, you should give me your number so I can text you my address for tomorrow. You, I say before I can stop myself. You want my phone number? Come on, Joy. Our friends are dating now. We're going to be seeing more of each other. Besides, I want to get something for Valentina, and I could use your approval. Before yesterday, I would have thought him having I, th I would have thought having his number in my phone would be the definition of absurd. But now I try to tell myself that punching that punching in Nathaniel's name and number is is logical and not ridiculous. We slip our phones into our coat pockets and stand awkwardly for a moment. I'm not sure how to end this interaction. Nathaniel steps forward. Just as I think he's about to walk past me, he leans down and kisses my cheek. Merry Christmas. And that's it. Oh my goodness, I'm blushing. Very ah, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> that means I did my job. Yay. It, it doesn't <laughs> so that takes us into our next writing prompt. If you'd like to talk about this one. Yeah, sure. So with that same with, with the same characters from prompt one, write about a moment of romantic vulnerability between them. Because as someone who loves writing moments of dancer and following it with moments of romantic vulnerability that is just such an incredible payoff so have fun with that fabulous we will turn on the music for another five minutes and then i'm excited to hear about your moments of romantic vulnerability when we come back so now we will move into our fabulous Q&A with Melissa. So if you have any questions for Melissa about I, the book, about the process of being a writer, 
whatever you'd like to know, you can either I unmute and say your question out loud, or you can put it in the chat and I will read it. So would anyone like to ask a question? I can go. Yeah. Um, Melissa, thanks so much for being here. Just was curious about what your writing process is like and how that has changed from your first book to your second book. Okay. Um, I honestly don't have one. I realize that's like a cop-out or a boring answer, but I really don't have it, It's mainly just like, I want to write right now. So I sit down, I find whatever music I'm currently listening to or something, and I write until my hands like don't want to write anymore until my brain is like no I need to break my eyes tell me no we need to break we can't we can't do this and um so honestly I don't really have one which I realize is is it could be a way of me skirting around the elephant in the room but I promise it's not I genuinely don't have a, I don't have a process which you would think after you know having you made our heartstrings come out and then love letters for joy because love letters for joy went from proposal to to probably finish draft in maybe six months so <laughs> so uh you honestly and plus balancing a full-time job and moving to new york city it's just give yourself grace however you write you're a writer no matter what you have going on and it's just giving yourself grace is also a big part of the process because if you write until you're burned out where you don't want to look at these characters anymore, where you're like, oh my God, I hate everything I've written. Like, um, like, do I even know like how to do this anymore? That you do, you do. What you need to do now, if as you're realizing those feelings, is close your Word doc, close your Google doc, just close everything down and go do something else. And you're gonna come back and you'll be fine. Just basically giving yourself grace and realizing where you're when you're close to burnout is part of my process regardless of if I recognize it myself because sometimes my roommate will be like no you're spiraling you're spiraling you're fine I'll be I'm like, I'm like okay okay I've got this I'm good so burnout is part of the process though but what you're gonna but what you should, what you need to do is just recognize that and then give yourself grace to calm down and to realize that you're going to be okay and you're going to be able to come back to this It's a great question. Thank you for that. We've got a few in the chat, so I'll start at the top. Uh, Ruby asks, what are some things that inspire you while writing? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I've never really thought about that before, which is very strange, but I think what inspires me in terms of writing Love Letters for Joy, because Love Letters for Joy, I when I initially had the idea, I wasn't intending for it to be a serial no retelling and then I realized oh wait it is okay so me being an unabashed theater kid is entirely in this book <laughs> like because that's what I was and that's probably why I love playing D&D &D. like like, like I, if I'm just pointing at myself <laughs> but like it's just we love letters for joy it was my love of romance and my love of theater and how and also my love of tropes that are in that book I was like let me just pack this book full of as many tropes as I want and let me do this really intricate relationship dynamic for the first time and see if I can pull it off and I did so like it's very much to the point of me taking in the world around me, taking in things that I love. And my favorite thing in the world is character creation. That is my favorite thing in the world, whether I am making my 11th cleric in D&D &D, or I am working on characters for a book or something else. I love character creation. So honestly, just knowing what I love about the whole process of being creative and writing is what inspires me. So. My advice, if anyone is looking for advice on this matter, just find what you love. If you love character work, have fun with it. It is literally whatever you make it, whatever you want to do. Or if you are someone who loves plot, number one, please tell me what plot is. Number two, just enjoy that and embrace your love of plot and your love of intricate world building. Just find what speaks to you and that will be your inspiration forward, I promise. I hear that so much. I'm a character person as well. What plot? Why? Things have to happen? Just, just have them kiss. 
please just, like yeah, it's, 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 please. It's, <laughs> we have another question that kind of touches on inspiration so i'll go to that one and then we have a few others um as well but you said this is from stephanie so thank you stephanie uh you said you write whenever you're inspired but how do you handle when you have no motivation to write when you feel like you'll never finish what you're writing if you have felt that how do you move through mm -hmm. those feelings i let myself stop uh, I because pushing myself is not good for me it's not good for my anxiety it's not good for my depression and i speak openly about my mental illnesses because it's important to break the stigma um and it's it's that's just not good on my body because especially as someone who is chronically ill on top of anxiety and depression it's not good for you to be physically stressed um and the mental stress turns into physical stress for me and and cerebral palsy affects your muscles my muscles are tight right now it, it, it it's not a good, <laughs> and it's it's just it's it just doesn't feel conducive to working properly and at, really at anything so why push myself when i am knowing my body is telling me you need to stop it's okay just step away from your computer go get your cat go sit on your couch go eat something good re-watch the unsleeping city for the upteenth time you're going to be fine you just need a bit of a break so i handle that by knowing i need a by knowing i need a break i don't let myself kind of push through that because that's just not going to get me personally anywhere and i and it's important that i recognize that yeah i think that is so important to say and to really hold true with ourselves too that i i think well, why are you pushing yourself to do something that doesn't feel right to you at this moment yeah exactly yeah um let's see our next question actually i you had just started to mention so i'll go into this one what is your favorite book or i or movie or whatever and if you have mm -hmm. a few if you have multiples tell us what do you like to read what do you like to watch okay well um my what the book that got me into why romance it's 13 years old now and I said um and as I say that I feel as if I have to walk into the sea because I am 32 years old um it's my the birth that got me into why romance was Anna and the French Kiss by Stephanie Perkins the love confession scene in that book is one of my favorite love confession scenes in all of fiction ever I love that book so much but I also am a huge huge fan of um, the Bone Houses, which is a YA fantasy horror about these two kids who go across a medieval whale whales to uncover this mystery of these creatures called the Bone Houses, which are anthropomorphic skeletons. And the girl is a grave digger. She has an axe. The boy is a map maker and he has chronic pain. And there is also an undead goat. And it is, it's, it's just, it's so much fun. And I, I'm, I'm just like, uh, like I, and there are moments as a disabled person where you're reading it and there and Ellis, the the male character, says stuff about disability. And I had to put the book down. I'm like, okay, I'm reading this book at 10:30 at night and and it's hitting me where I live. <laughs> and so there's that. And there's romance in that book. So it's very, very sweet. Um, if you're like, you know, if you if you like your horror with a little bit of romance, you know, and uh some skeletons, that's also good. Um, what else though? I am I I, I would be remiss if I also didn't mention. 1500 Miles from the Sun by my friend Johnny Garzavia. That book is incredible. And I've also read Andre and Santi Were Here by Johnny Garzavia, which is their next book coming out um, very soon. And I love that too. So it's, I'm just so blessed to have writer friends in my life who I just love and whose books I love. And it's just so sweet. So I hope that everyone here finds that community and it feels like you guys are cultivating it here. So that's just really special. So take that to heart. Oh, that is so cool. Yeah, to be able to, I see your friends' books out there and get to, I read them and support them. That's amazing. Okay, so we have uh, a question from Aldia. Aladia? Ali? Adalia. Adalia. Wow. Um, <laughs> sorry about that, Adalia. Um, so the question is, have you used sensitivity readers? And if so, how do you find them? I haven't used sensitivity readers for Love Letters for Joy. But um, as far as how you can find them, 
there's a lot of networking online. My roommate is a sensitivity reader, actually. Um, and I've worked as a sensitivity reader before because I've 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 worked in I've I'm coming up on my first year or my first full year of working in children's publishing, but I've been in children's I've been in children's publishing for a little bit before that. So I worked as a sensitivity reader too. And so my advice on finding them is I know there are networks out there online, so you can seek them out that way. I know that there's there might have been a database somewhere at some point, but I honestly can't remember that. I hope that answers your question at least somewhat. Um, I apologize if it is that. No, I think that's great. I really appreciate that. And then I will open the floor. Any other, any final questions for Melissa from the group? If not, I have a question. What's your question? I'm sure, you all have time for it. I would love to hear about how much input or control you had about this beautiful cover because I'm obsessed with it and I would love to I what was the process of that did they kind of give you I say in what this cover looks like how do you feel about it do you feel like it represents the story okay um so fun fun uh piece of you know uh so I was on my way to sign stock at Books of Wonder for the launch event for you, me, and our heartstrings, the day of the launch event, I believe. So I was, I had, I, I was getting ready to go. I was like, okay, I, I, I have to get in this Uber and go, 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 like, like, and I have to come back and get ready. This idea, like, I'm go, like, I'm running around like a chicken with its head cut off. Let me just do this. I, I'm so busy. And as I was getting ready to leave, my editor emailed me, and she's like, "Here's the final cover of the letters for joy." so like the first time I saw the cover it looked like this and I I just started screaming <laughs> just, like 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 it's absolutely gorgeous I I love it so much and it definitely embodies the book um and because it because Union Square is a pretty big part of the book it's it's one of my favorite places in New York City um but also it's where Joy lives and so uh, and to have Union Square on the cover, and I know exactly where this is. I know if you go to Union Square, you know exactly where this part is. Um, and so to have Union Square on the cover is amazing. To have Joy as her beautiful fat self with her Ace Pride bag is amazing. And it's just, it's even just down to her freckles on like, they, they got everything. Reen got everything. And even just having just simple, just simple things like a dog, because there is a scene with with golden retrievers in this book, and they have a dog on the cover. And there's also casual wheelchair rep in the background, which like you just do not see. And the fact that the, the fact that the thought of that even happened just overjoys me because there is a character um in the letters for joy who is a wheelchair user. I will not spoil who he is, but I love him very much. Um, and so to have that representation on the cover is amazing and just joy and you know, whoever Cupid is, uh, they're adorable. And I love the height difference because they do have a considerable height difference. Height difference is one of my favorite tropes in the world. I love it. I, I put it in basically everything. <laughs> so, so like, I just love this cover so much. And it's just, it's just, so, it's just so special to me. I'm so glad because I love it too. And I got, I got nervous that like, oh God, maybe it's not what she wanted to do. Oh, no, 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 don't worry at all. No, 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 no. Well, thank you all so, so much. If you do have any further questions uh, for Melissa, we are going to let you know how to get in touch with her uh, in the future. If we could put up uh, the Twitter for Melissa, it is just at Melissa C. Instagram is at Melissa C. Writes. Please do follow along with everything they are doing. And with all of that said, thank you all so, so much for being here. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you for writing your incredible book and for sharing your insights and your ideas with us tonight. It was wonderful to see all of the writing that you all created and all of the things that you shared. We appreciate you all so much. And thank you for, for being here. Have a fantastic Friday night. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you for coming. <laughs>